Hi, I'm Mark Mattioli, and welcome to another reading of Boston Accent. Boston Accent is available on Amazon.com, and it contains mature subject matter. Okay, let's pick up where we left off. One day, while walking through the village, I stopped to talk to a pilgrim girl, as I often did when tourists went around. This girl was just as aggressive with me as I was with her, and I liked her style. I asked her name, and she said, Prudence Pridemore. And I said, no, your real name. Because the actors in the village always stayed in character while they were on the clock. She looked at me and said, that is my real name. Sorry, it sounds a little dated, that's all, but it's very nice, I told her. She just kept smiling right up to me, asking her to join me for lunch, with her accepting. We agreed to meet at 12 noon near the main entrance of the museum, and when I saw her walking up to me wearing the pilgrim outfit, my jaw dropped. Aren't you going to change, I asked. No, I don't have time. Are you going to be embarrassed to be seen with me? She said. No. I'm fine with what you're wearing. I just wish I hadn't left my Native American loincloth at home. I feel so overdressed. Darn, will you wear it for me another time, she said. You can count on it, I said. We both laughed and headed across the street to an oceanfront restaurant that was a favorite of mine called Seascapes. The restaurant had two entrances. One was the main dining room, and the other was a pub. We agreed to dine in the pub, and when we entered, everything stopped. Every conversation came to a screeching halt at the sight of a pilgrim girl entering the pub. Under my breath, but loud enough to hear, I said, You'd think they never saw a pilgrim before. Prudence smiled and said, Still not embarrassed? I'm fine. Just really regretting not wearing the loincloth, I said as our waitress approached with a big sheet and grin on her face. Prudence was still laughing from the loincloth comment when the waitress said, This is a first. And I smiled and said, For the both of us. Prudence shrugged and said, Just another day for me. It was one of the most enjoyable lunches I've ever had, and I couldn't wait to see her again with or without the costume. As it turned out, Prudence invited me to her home for dinner the following weekend. Oh boy. Unfortunately for the both of us, Prudence was very puritanical in real life, and although she was in her mid-twenties, she was still a virgin and had strong Christian values, val values about what an unmarried man and woman can and can't do. I liked her very much, but I told her it wasn't going to work. We remained friends as co-workers, but conversations between us after that were forced and uncomfortable. Things may have turned out different at dinner if I had remembered the loincloth. Every so often, I would report to work a bit under the weather from the night before and pay for it dearly, just wanting the day to end so I could go home and sleep it off. I may not have had the strength during this period of my life to stay home on a weeknight, but I always went to work the next day and I never called in sick unless I was really sick. I had the alcoholic gene in me from my dad, but I also had a strong work, work ethic instilled in me from my grandfather. One such morning, when I had overdone it the night before, I found myself at work hating life and I just needed to lie down for a little while so I could get my second wind. I decided the, bless, the best place to do this was the village, so I headed on down to scope it out. It was still early, so the flow of tourists was light, and I entered a pilgrim home that looked vacant. I found a pilgrim woman in her late twenties, alone in the house, churning butter, and I asked her if she minded if I spend some time overhead in the law for research purposes. She was in character and told me to help myself. I was pleased to find the loft was lined with hay and settled down into it and was asleep in no time. 
Anyone who's ever been around me knows that I snore while sleeping, and it didn't take long f for my butter churner down below to become savvy to it. She was still alone, but she spotted a group of tourists headed away, so she began slamming the handle of the churner against the loft in an effort to wake me. I awoke just as the group entered the house, but what I did was roll over, which sent hay cascading down through the slits in the loft floor, landing on the heads of the churner and her guests. Everyone looked up at the loft, and the churner's staying, staying character told the guest that there were demons in the loft, and she's trying to rid them from the house. She began to chant while churning the butter. Out of my house, demons! You're not welcome here! Demons in my loft! Leave this place! Leave this house! Demons in my loft! I'm more or less fully awake now, and lying still, having come to the conclusion... There must be more than the Turner down there, you think? That was confirmed when I heard a child's voice say, Is there someone up there? And the Turner answered, Yes, there's a demon in the loft, but they won't be there for long. The adults seemed to have a pretty good idea of what was going on and found it amusing. The Turner did not. When the group had left, the Turner banged the loft again and said, Demon, you have to go. And I climbed down from the loft, covered in hay, and brushed myself off. The churner then grabbed me and pushed me towards the door and said, Out, demon snorer! Stay out of my loft! Come back here again, and you'll end up on the stocks! I started to ask her out, and then thought better of it. I didn't have much luck with pilgrims. You can quote me on that. Pilgrims. I had been doing a lot of thinking about Diana and the baby. We now had no contact at all, and Diana was six months pregnant. I started second-guessing myself as to whether I should have made a commitment to be there for her and the baby. The more I thought about it, the darker my mood grew, and I began to drink more. On a Saturday night, with Diana in my head, I got together with the guys, and we went cruising for a party. We ended up in a parking lot in Danforth, in the middle of nowhere, where the spoiled the rich kids of Danforth drank, and the cops left them alone. I was driving, and as I parked, I noticed the stares from the kids that were gathered here. This was not a friendly hangout for us. We didn't, we didn't know anyone here, and we weren't welcome. But compared to us, these guys were nerds, and none of them said anything to us as we got out of the car. There were five of us, including myself, Sean, Brett, Donnie, and Jeff. The Danforth group numbered at least 50, all guys in their teens and early 20s. There was nothing here for us. and We should never have stopped, but we did. I was in a real mood, and I was looking for someone to mess with. As I pushed my way through the, through the groups of kids with money, having boring, boring conversations while drinking their imported beer provided with their, from their parents' giving them, them their weekly allowance. I gave everyone dirty looks as I wandered through the group alone as my companions chose to stay with the car. As I walked by one group, I heard someone quoting the Bible, and I thought, this is the last conversation I expected to hear. I stopped to hear more of what he had to say and size up the individuals who had gathered around him. The one individual continued to preach to the group with no one else saying a word till I got in his face. I really didn't agree. I disagreed with what he was saying. I just thought his subject matter had no place in these surroundings. The bottom line is, I had a major attitude problem, and if I hadn't found this guy, I would have found somebody else. I'm in this guy's face, challenging what he's saying, and then I begin to insult him. I'm trying to get him mad enough to take a swing at me so I can hit him back. I've never liked throwing the first punch, but throw a punch at me or somebody I'm with, and it's on. This guy wanted nothing to do with me, and he was not going to swing at me, even if I insulted his mother. So I decided to head back to the car. As I turned to walk away, I realized my ins insults had attracted a, a lot of attention, and there was a large circle, four men deep around me. I was face to face with one guy blocking my path. I looked him in the eye and said, move. And he stepped out of my way. I said, bunch of fucking pussies. And a fist came out of the crowd and caught me in the side of the head. 
I turned to see who threw the punch as the guy ducked back into the crowd and I went after him. As I did, another punch came from somebody else and they jumped back into the crowd. I decided to just hit anybody. I didn't just hit anybody I didn't know, which was everybody here except for the four guys I rode with. One by one, I just started punching people in the face, trying to get to the car. For every punch I threw, I got hit three or four times. Finally, my four companions who were watching from the car realized that I'm in the middle of it, and they run to my side. Their main objective was to get me to the car as they made a path through the crowd. And as they're dragging me, I'm still getting hit. But I can't reciprocate with them holding my arms and dragging me. I'm just getting punched. We get to the car, and as I get behind the wheel, I tell my companions that I have weapons under the seat. Let's make a stand. We didn't take these guys, I'm protesting, and tr I'm trying to get out of the car. Brett reaches over, turns the key in the ignition, puts the car in drive, and tells me to floor it. This huge crowd is all around the car and throwing punches in the window. Someone reaches in, grabs Sean by the hair, tries to pull him out the window, and rips out a clump of his hair. Brett and Donnie got punched in the face, and Jeff found a metal pipe under my seat and threw it into the crowd, striking someone in the head. Just as I realized this is a lost cause, <laughs> I know it took me a while, I hit the accelerator and a fist comes through the air, fist comes, fist comes into the window and hits me square on the nose. Blood is gushing out of my nose as I drive at the crowd while they jump out of the way, banging on the car, throwing beer bottles at us. I had gotten the worst of it, but it didn't bother me at all. It was kind of what I wanted. I needed a good ass kicking to cleanse myself from everything in my life that was bringing me down. Some people go to confession. I challenge 50 guys to a fight. My friends did not see eye to eye with me on this, and they were bullshit for having to get involved in something that they had nothing had nothing to do with them. The only the only one that was unscathed was Jeff, and he was doing the most bitching. He was going on and on about starting shit in a no-win situation. That night when I got home, I'm in bed, and my mom knocks on the door and asks, Are you okay? There's a trail of blood leading to your door. I tell her, I'm fine, just a bloody nose. And I roll over and go back to sleep. Okay, thus endeth the lesson. We got another segment that's, uh, we'll do it tomorrow. God willing, I'm Mark Mattioli. We're reading Boston Accent. And uh, I've got a, um, a cousin I recently found over in Italy where my grandparents are from, and uh, he started reading this yesterday. He doesn't uh, read or speak a lick of English, but he's watching this, so I just wanted to um, say, uh, Ciao Aldo! Aldo! I'm going to start uh, translating a little Italian and, uh, and mixing it in here, okay? So now you're going to be able to read the, read the book and learn Italian. Italiano! Ciao Aldo! Uh, oh, that's that's Luca. Luca's groaning. He's like, oh, Christ, not Italian. He's a, he's a funny guy. All right, that's it. We're out of here. Ciao, baby.